Welcome to the Tailored Life Podcast, the one and only fitness and nutrition podcast that goes way beyond just training and nutrition. I'm your host, Cody McBroom, and today we are interviewing the legendary Alan Aragon. Alan Aragon is one of the founders of If It Fits Your Macros, quite literally, and it it took a spin and went a direction that he didn't intend for it to uh, go because he was more about balance and flexible dieting. And the reason it was created was because they were trying to answer questions to help people, which we'll get into the story and the evolution, the origin stories of If It Fits Your Macros in this podcast today, because he's going to give us a deep background of who he is, how we came about, how If It Fits Your Macros started. And then we're going to go down multiple rabbit holes of all the fad diets you can think of and how none of them debunk calories in versus calories out. We even bring up hormones and carnivore and keto and intermittent fasting and everything that I tried to throw at him to try to debunk calories in versus calories out and energy balance just didn't work. And there's research to support his claims, uh, which is why you're really going to enjoy this podcast because not only is it science and evidence-based, but it's also extremely applicable and it's actually geared in a way that is practical to your lifestyle. And that's really what we focused on during the conversation. Add to that, Alan has been in the industry for multiple decades and he's one of the leading research content creator nutritionists that there are out there. He's actually one of the first people I ever started studying from a perspective of nutrition. We talked about it. it was over a decade ago that I first saw him speak and started reading his content, his books. And he had the very first research review. So there's a lot now, most of which were students of his that ended up creating other research reviews. But this guy literally created the first research review to help people understand science on a better level. So he is a pioneer, like truly a pioneer uh, to the core of that word in the nutrition coaching world. And I'm really excited for you guys to hear this podcast because it was an absolute honor to have him on the show. If you enjoy this podcast with me and Alan, make sure you do me a huge favor. Uh, share it on your Instagram story and tag us both. My Instagram handle is at Cody McBroom. His is at the Alan Aragon. And I'll link both of those in the description of this podcast, as well as his research review, his website for his books and his Instagram profile. Uh, so without any further ado, let's talk to the one and only Alan Aragon. All right. So Alan, as, as I uh, kind of mentioned before we started, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on because to me, you're a legend in the space, man. I've been following you for a long time. Um, as I explained to you with the seminar I went to, I don't know how long, over a decade ago now, um, to see you speak, but uh, I've, I've read your books. I've been a part of your research review. I've uh, followed your content closely. You've been an authority in the industry for a very long time um, and somebody that I've always looked at as one of the top people to kind of cross-check anything you're doing. Like You're always going to provide no bullshit advice and information based on research, and you're not going to let any type of guruism or marketing or fad or hyping up. Uh, change that. And and I really appreciate that. And I think the industry needs that. And it's kind of why people like you have stuck through the industry the whole time while these other fads come and go, and you're always there to help. So thank you for everything you've done, man. And thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited about it. Well, thanks right back, Cody, for you to recognize that is huge. And it's really why guys like me do what we do. We want to be able to make the industry better, make the world better. And just sort of seeing that, um, I've been able to at least contribute to raising the collective intelligence and the collective effectiveness of practitioners and enthusiasts in the industry. It, it means everything. So, so thanks right back. Yeah, absolutely, man. You definitely have. So, um, speaking of which let's kind of, uh, give your story in a nutshell. I mean, really just introduce you to uh, the listeners. We have a lot of okay. trainers, nutritionists, coaches, and, and enthusiasts on the podcast. So I'd be shocked if they don't know who you are. Um, and if they okay. don't, shame on them. But but please fill us in, man. Like, uh, who is Alan Aragon? And, and why do you do what you just did? How did this all start? Okay, so we have to go back to in the early 90s when uh, a scientific basis in the fitness industry was kind of non-existent. And so I came from the academic realm where it was almost a, an overemphasis on academia and research and, and basically people had no real world experience. <laughs> so I saw that in the fitness industry, there was a huge gap um, in terms of people knowing what the value of science was and, and knowing how to apply what we know in science and research to fitness. And so when social media happened, this was the perfect way to kind of get that information out there, have discussions and debates with folks on the, on the bodybuilding forums and the fitness forums. And uh, that it just kind of snowballed from there. So 
in 2003, um, I was pretty close having come off of my graduate degree in nutrition. So when I popped on the um, fitness forums in 2003, just the amount of, in quotes, bro science and uh, the amount of wild claims that were being thrown around was it was just really fun to kind of tackle these things one at a time and have discussions with people online. And it was a fun challenge to have debates without creating enemies, you know, because it's a lot of this stuff is emotionally charged. People just invest all of their, uh, their, their physical and metaphysical beings into the, these beliefs that, that just drive their, their habits and, and, and their protocols. And so, yeah, it, it snowballed from there. Um, from that point, uh, I had been a, uh, a practitioner in the field, a trainer since the early 90s. And um, I transitioned to nutritional counseling in the early 2000s. And so when 2010 came along, I had already gotten a start in um, putting the research out there to, uh, to the online space. Um, I started my research review, which was in 2008, and um, a, a few of my, well, let's call them what they are, a few of my students <laughs> who rose up to the top of the ranks, um, they did their own versions of their research reviews, and it's been a wild ride because as we were just, just chatting about, one of the goals of having done what I've done in the industry is to create leaders and create people who are uh, putting out great content. And it's been really cool to see the, in quotes, evidence-based movement get started and gain momentum and really start to spread. And uh, it's still kind of a small niche, but I know you asked for the nutshell of this, but okay. So this is basically yeah. the nutshell. I, I'm one of the forerunners, for, forefathers, if you will, of the evidence-based movement in the fitness industry. And by evidence-based practice, at least in the fitness context, <clears throat> it's essentially using research or the published peer-reviewed research as a basis for programming and filling in the knowledge gaps with uh, field observations and, and professional experience. So that's kind of the essence of what evidence-based practice is. E evidence-based practice is not finding an abstract of, of a study that you didn't read and then rubbing it in somebody's face saying, ha ha, you're wrong. Check this out. That's really not what it's about. <laughs> it's about really kind of the, the marriage of science and experience that bridges the gaps in the science. Yeah. I love that definition. I, and I often say that Eric Helms had a quote. Um, I believe it was on my podcast. He said it. And I don't know if that's the first time he said it, but uh, it was in research. We work with averages in coaching. We work with individuals. And I thought that was a really good take on it because I think that's a good look at it. Like we're all looking, not all of us, but we all should be looking at the research that's done on all these individuals on an average basis, but then taking it and applying it in real world to get experience with that science based information to, to come up with the evidence based practical application, if that makes sense. That is a great way to put it because in research studies, the results report the averages, right? They report the means. And so within a group of, of study subjects, there's going to be responses that are all, all over the map. Some people will fall above the mean, some people will be below the mean. There's going to be hyper responders, hypo responders, and every, everybody in between. And so with um, research studies reporting the averages, it, it's important to keep that in mind that you can't just look at that number as gospel because you might be one of the folks who falls way above or way below the meat. So, so yeah, that's why I, I totally agree um, with that, that quote of individualization being what goes on in the field. So I assume people making the mistake of what we're talking about right here and not doing that is, is why, but um to get your answer on it, why did you start the research review originally? What was the, because yours, as far as I know, was the first ever, and it's honestly such a great idea, and people ask me all the time, you know, 
what should I do for continuing education? Should I be getting more certifications? And although sometimes I say yes, because there are good certifications, if you don't have any, you should probably get one or two. Um, but a lot of times that's my first recommendation. I'm like, go get the research reviews because these guys, even myself, I've been doing this a long time. I still can't interpret research the same way you guys do. And that's why we have Brandon on our team because I'll run things by him and he'll give me insights that I wasn't able to interpret. And I think number one, it takes a humble coach to admit that you know, but mm -hmm. ultimately you have to be able to, to outsource that. So it's so valuable, but what caused you to start that originally? Just seeing, well, it's a combination of my personal interest in the topics and also seeing that there were a lot of people who shared my interest and passion in the topics. And I saw this by just, you know, basically moderating the forums, seeing the discussions, seeing that people would spend like one to three days debating on a, on a single topic at a time. And just, there was just endless hours spent discussing and debating, you know, it's this, no, it's that. And I'm like, man, it, what would really be great is if I could corner myself into a platform where I looked at these topics in an organized manner and, and just put the information out there and say, okay, this is the state of the knowledge on this topic. And there's either going to be some pretty cut and dry answers, or it's going to basically be up in the air with a lot of gray area and just a lot of speculation, a lot of, a, a lot of aspects of a given topic that we just don't know because they, we don't have the data. And so I think it, th that's really what, that's really what sparked it. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's little details too, that, that, uh, kind of embarrassing, but, um, I wrote my, my first self-published book in 2007 and Lyle McDonald, like publicly criticized a claim in my book, uh, that I, it was a claim that I just regurgitated from a certification that I got. It, it was, um, the number of calories burned per pound of muscle per day. I just regurgitated some wacky number that I learned in my certification and Lyle just tore it apart publicly, you know, like in, in McDonald's style. And I'm like, oh crap, you know, I, I really got to sharpen up on, on the research. I really got to stay on top of this because that, that kind of stuff shouldn't happen. And so this was back in 2007. And then that was sort of the push over the cliff for me to go, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to force myself to learn everything I can and, and put it out there. And so that's how the research review was born. I love it. Was that the lean muscle diet? The Lean Muscle Diet was actually a 2014 publication. Okay. Um, the tw 2007 publication is, is Girth Control. Uh. <laughs> that's, the name, that's the name of the book, Girth Control. Um, and yeah, that that's way, way, way back. I'm, I'm scared to crack that book open and <laughs> review what I said in it. But yeah. <laughs> well, that's what's so interesting too. Things change so much. I have to go back and... I've been writing blogs since 2012 and I mean, and I have to go back sometimes cause I'll get an email and somebody will ask me a question about a blog and I'm like, Oh shit, I need to, <laughs> I need to run through this real quick. Cause this has been a while, but, um, I love that. And so for the, for the newer listeners, uh, not to the podcast, but to the industry, people new in the industry, uh, Alan's mentioned forums a few times. Forums were what discussions were based in before social media. Um, and I remember actually I was a clerk at a Rite Aid while I was trying to study this stuff. And I would like have my phone and, and my computer. I'd be like looking through stuff while working, um, in the back, I was That's like a box dope. boy and stuff, but I used to, I was too afraid to actually comment cause I didn't know enough back then, but I would go through and just follow certain people on the, the forum boards and just see <laughs> what the debates were and just read and I mean, I remember so many people, some of which I've had on the podcast now, just, just debating people online in these forums on bodybuilding.com or T Nation and all kinds of stuff. And it was, um, it's a really, it's really cool to look back and think about that stuff, actually. It, it was like a sport. Yeah. Honestly. And, and sometimes it felt like a full contact sport. <laughs> <laughs> Bruises and everything. Yeah. Broken jaws and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the old message board days and then Facebook came along and kind of, uh, shut those forums down. Yeah. Um, I believe I've heard you say that if it fits your macros, quote unquote, um, mm -hmm. or flexible dieting, if you want to call it that was originally kind of founded in these forums. Was it not? And yeah, I think you were a, a yeah. big part of that back in the day, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, a kind of a funny story. And for those who hear it for the first time, it is kind of mind blowing. Um, 
we have to go back to about 2008, 2009. And that's when the IIFYM acronym was born. <clears throat> and I was a, a moderator on the bodybuilding.com message boards. And so uh, myself um, and a couple of other forum veterans, uh, we finally got tired of, of telling the, 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 the newbies who would ask if they can have this or that food on a cut. And now I say on a cut while they're, while they're on a fat loss phase, people would ask things like, Hey, can I have, um, white rice when I'm cutting or, um, does it need to be brown rice, you know, or can I have, can I have peanut butter while I'm cutting it, it, is that okay? Can I have milk while I'm cutting? And just any and all foods. It wasn't just um, the stereotypical junk foods that people were asking about, like the stereotypical hyper palatable foods. People literally would ask, hey guys, um, I I'm going to be cutting. It. Do I need to throw out the egg yolks, you know, or, you know, do, do I have to go all egg whites and, and just stuff like that? People are like, well, these folks actually don't know what the mechanics of fat loss are. They don't, you know, they, they don't have a concept of something as fundamental as imposing a caloric deficit. And they don't have a concept of something as fundamental as grams of protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Um, so it really got kind of tiresome to spell out if those egg yolks fit into your, your macronutrient targets for, well, in this case, for dietary fat, then it's perfectly fine to have to have that food. And it was this sentence that we, we tried to pare it down. If it fits your macros, go for it. If, if it fits into your macronutrient targets, go ahead. And so we had to answer questions like that dozens of times a day because mm -hmm. the message boards were super popular at the time. There were just hundreds and hundreds of users coming on and a, a, a huge influx of uh, interest in fitness and bodybuilding and everybody just flooded the message boards. And so it kind of got to a point where we got so sick of saying, if it fits your macronutrient targets, then go ahead and have that food. That we just made the acronym, if it fits your macros, I-I-F-Y-M. And we would just write it down there, right? And, and people would be kind of confused and they would just look it up, look up what that means. Yeah, if it fits your macronutrient targets, then go ahead and have that foods. And admittedly, it was kind of a lazy way to try to help the community out, but you had to have been there to see how many times people asked, hey guys, uh, is, it, is it okay if I have white potatoes in my diet during a cut or is that going to mess up my cut? Like, bro. <laughs> 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 and so what happened was something totally unforeseen. Okay, so people took the IIFYM acronym and turned it into a junk food diet because people were seeing that they could hit their body composition goals, basically filling in the macronutrient targets with whatever food they want, okay? And it is possible to do that as long as there's a certain minimal degree of uh, protein quality, right? You can have somewhat crappy carb and crappy fat sources and as long as your, your protein is good, then you, you know, you'll lose weight, you can gain muscle, you can, you know, gain strength, maintain strength and all that stuff. And of course, there are long term challenges and implications of getting your carbs and fats from let's say pop tarts. <laughs> but um, this is kind of a younger audience and they weren't necessarily given much of a crap about long term health, they just wanted to get jacked fibras. So it was just super interesting to see people take the IAFYM acronym and then run away with it and have it spiral into this actual diet brand when it was really just our way of saying, yeah, you, you can fit if you, as long as you, you like cheese, oh, you love cheese, great. As long as you can fit that into your macronutrient targets, then you can have cheese on your diet and still lose fat. So that concept was taken towards, oh yeah, it doesn't matter what you fill your macronutrients with. You know, as long as you hit those numbers, you're great, which is false. Um, and there are other 
implications surrounding the whole if it fits your macros concept and there are other aspects too that that are there was this false conflation with counting macros and flexible dieting those are not the same thing <laughs> they're just not and and back if you look back into the literature of the origin of flexible dieting it has everything to do with the cognitive style of dietary restraint. So there is rigid restraint and there's flexible restraint. So rigid restraint views everything in dichotomous terms, black, white terms, good, bad, um, you know, uh, uh, healthy, unhealthy. And when things are viewed in dichotomous terms, there tends to be um, a greater potential for backlash and self-sabotage. Um, and flexible dietary restraint views diet and views these sort of targets and goals as flexible depending on where the person is at at the at the given time and so it really it, it, the origins of flexible dieting had nothing to do with counting macronutrient grams because in a lot of senses that can end up manifesting as a form of rigid dietary restraint like when you have this number in your mind 150 grams of protein and by the end of the day, you're at 145 and then you start stressing out. Okay, what can I do is, I don't know, maybe eat a three, three quarters of an egg in order to hit this last <laughs> five grams. That, that's a pathological level of, um, of dietary control. <laughs> so I want to get it straight that when people, and this is very common and, and it's really no, no singular person's fault. People conflate IIFYM and flexible dieting. Um, they, they interchange those terms and that's simply false because flexible dieting isn't about, it, it's not synonymous with counting macros. Flexible dieting really is about individualizing the approach to the diet. And that includes the degree of flexibility and rigidity of the approach. So if you wanted to do real flexible dieting, you would assess the individual and find out what's the best approach for them to take. What's their situation? What are their goals? Are they literally about to do a show in you know, four, four months? Or is it somebody who wants to make healthy habit changes? And you, and everybody, everybody in between, and you assess the approach. Do they want to take a more quantitative approach to diet and nutrition, or are they more inclined and do they have a personal preference for taking a more qualitative and less micromanaging approach? Everybody is different in this regard. Some people love macronutrient um, tracking apps. Others hate it. And not only that, for others, it can exacerbate pre-existent uh, eating disorder tendencies. So this really all has to be worked out on an individual level. And that individualization of approach, that is flexible dieting. Mm -hmm. Taking into consider, like focusing on just body composition here, not the mindset, because I agree with that. And we've done a whole podcast talking about, because um, we get that question all the time, you know, whether or not it's healthy from a re food relationship perspective to track macros and weigh your food. And it's, it's completely dependent on the individual, but in regards to actually changing body composition, short term, it's obvious the, the dogmatic IFYM approach of just eating. I mean, the poster child for IFYM is pop tarts, right? Eating pop tarts and having protein shakes. Um, or like that can get you to your body composition goals. But if we're focusing on that, uh, less optimal from a health perspective, micronutrient perspective, point of view, are we indirectly going to hurt our body composition results long-term if we follow that? I guess I'm asking really like, yeah, eight weeks, if it fits your macros it up, it might work. But after 24 weeks, are we still going to see those positive changes from a sustainability perspective? Or do you think there's indirect issues with that? That's a really good question, man. And it varies with the individual, but generally speaking, an approach where you, you, you have a, a lot of the foods predominating the diet being um, hyper palatable and uh, energy dense, nutrient sparse, then what you end up running into is 
a satiety issue. And um, a lot of times when folks really just load the diet up with, with junk foods that are easy to overconsume, it's it gets pretty difficult to sustain appropriate total energy intake. Because sometimes some of those foods, they can exacerbate cravings and then it can lead to sort of this, this up creep in energy intake because of a lack of satiating effect. Um, so just to kind of draw a concrete example, <clears throat> Let's imagine you you eat a you remember that 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 food soylent and then there's other other foods like that where hey just drink all your nutrition in this this goop that we've got here for you mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about eating just drink this this goop a couple few times a day and you're good well that would be the extreme end of it and you can begin to see the issues that come up with that you don't get you don't get the experience of eating. You don't get the um, multi-faceted, multi-tiered sensory experience of, uh, of, of a meal. And it's just not satiating and it's just not satisfying. And then you end up developing potentially pathological levels of craving and, and appetite dysregulation. And then you just rebel against the whole thing. So that can, in theory, that can happen if all you did was get your, your nutrients from, let's say protein powder and Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you know, you hit your macros, but, but, you know, your carb and fat sources were Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So there, the, yeah, the big issue with that is down the line, the long-term health effects in terms of promoting um, optimal health and preventing chronic disease, there's going to be some potential manifestations there. And also you, you may struggle with having a diet that is satiating enough for you to sustain that. Got it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think there's, there's a lot to consider here and this kind of like leads into an array of questions I have for you today. But before we get into those, I kind of want to mm -hmm. ask a follow-up question to this cause it'll provide context. Um, is there a way around calories in versus calories out? And the reason I'm asking that is because we're gonna, I'm going to ask you about a few different fad diets that I don't think you're a, fr a fan of um, and some just comparative <laughs> diets that neither is maybe bad, but people like to um, create a lot of hype or guruism around one side versus the other, let's say low carb, high fat versus high carb, um, or just a moderate balance approach. But, um, and we'll get into those, but is there any way around calories in versus calories out? Because there are people out there that are creating um, almost like it seems like they're trying to create loopholes within the research to show people that there is, but it's hard to really believe, at least from my perspective. So I want to ask an expert. That's a great question once again. And there, the short answer before I go into a long, long winded diatribe is that there is no way around calories in calories out. That is the final stop. <laughs> you got to, there, there's no getting around energy balance, especially when we're talking about uh, weight loss, weight gain goals. Uh, things get muddy and murky when we start talking about changes in body composition. Um, but for the general goals of weight gain and weight loss, there's no getting around energy balance. Um, what people tend to do is make the claim that it's not about calories in, calories out. It's about hormones. It's, you, you focus on the hormones, and then you'll, you'll reach X, Y, or Z goal. Well, the simple answer to that claim is that the reason that hormones are also important is because hormones influence the energy equation. And the way that hormones influence the energy equation is either directly by affecting, for example, thyroid hormone, which regulates metabolic rate and which regulates thermogenesis, um, or these hormones will influence appetite, which once again, circle all the way back to eating behaviors that drive either overeating or under eating total calories. So it's not a matter of hormones versus calories. It's that hormones influence the calorie equation. They're, they're kind of in, inseparable. They actually are inseparable. So hormones count, calories count, they are interconnected. 
Uh, but the last stop and the final stop really is, is energy balance when we're talking about these goals. Hey guys, I want to take a quick second to shout out the sponsor of this podcast, which is myself. It's my own app, The Tailored Trainer, which is the simple solution to actually looking like you lift. My goal with The Tailored Trainer was to do just that. I had countless amount of people coming into our coaching to get nutrition guidance from us and they needed training help as well. And I was tired of hearing people tell me, I don't look like I lift. I'm in the gym hours every week. I'm training hard. I'm pushing myself. I'm sweating my ass off, but I don't look like I work out. What is the deal? And the deal is simple. There isn't a periodized plan backing up the effort they are putting in the gym. They don't have progressive overload methods and metrics and measurements inside their programming that are going to guide them to the result they're after, which is why I wanted to create an app that did that for you. Not only does it have actually systemized programs that are effective for your goal, for your schedule, for your body type, and for your experience, because there are tons of programs in there. That's why it's called the tailored trainer, because you can literally tailor your training to your lifestyle and your schedule and your experience level. But it's also going to have the software and the metrics inside to make sure that it's progressive and periodized without you even realizing it. You don't have to do anything, and it is programmed properly to get you to progress, which is why I always tell people, stop aimlessly working out using influencers' Instagram posts and YouTube videos as your plan. Start actually tailoring the training process to you, and you can do that by downloading this app. It's less than $1 a day, and you can head over to tailoredtrainer.net to read more about it, see screenshots of the app live itself, see reviews from some of the people using it, and see a personal letter from myself as to why I created this app in the first place. So once again, head over to tailoredtrainer.net. Now, let's get back into the podcast. With, uh, there, there's a few different ones, carnivore, intermittent fasting, keto, there's all these different ones. And a lot of times they, they do the same thing. And I'm glad you brought up the hormones because that's usually the example I give as well. Um, with things like intermittent fasting and people claim that it almost, and, and you know, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Danny Lennon and, and he put out a lot of research around uh, Corona nutrition. And that was the first time that I kind of stopped and was like, oh shit, maybe something is kind of changing calorie, like it doesn't eliminate it, but it's changing it a little bit because they're seeing some changes, which really like once I dug deeper, it just seemed like, well, they're intermittent fasting, but they're placing more calories in the morning, which means energy output throughout the day is higher because you just have more energy. So neat goes up and <laughs> Lo and behold, still energy balance. And I think the point is, is like what I've noticed is the more I am in this industry, the more people I, I meet that are researchers and the more research I dig into, the more everything just kind of solidifies calories in versus calories out even more so, right? And there's really no trick around it. Um, now, intermittent fasting, there's a lot of claims that aren't tied to um, – calories like autophagy and um, the people talk about uh, productivity and, and I've always looked at it as like well when you're hungry and cortisol's up you're probably going to be a little bit more alert and that might help but what is like what are your opinions on intermittent fasting and there are there any non-energy balance benefits that would be meaningful to people um, or do you feel like that's all kind of just gurism and it's just an <laughs> adherence tool yeah well it's all interesting stuff but when you really dig in and you really look at it, you start thinking, okay, how can we take this hypothetical, theoretical, speculative knowledge, which is what it is. People are just speculating their balls off, basically. How do we take that and apply it to uh, real world clients? And the answer is, you may never, you may never need to do that you may never need to impose another five, six rules onto somebody's program. Because when you take care of the big rocks, which is total daily nutrition and a sound training program, all of the other stuff, like not eating past 6 p.m., um, not, eating a, a, not, not having a feeding window greater than eight hours or nine hours, um, not eating... Uh, a certain uh, level of carbohydrate after X PM or um, uh, an even crazier one, waiting an hour uh, to eat anything at all uh, after you wake up, all of that stuff ends up being counterproductive, <laughs> actually. Uh, it ends up adding complexity and rules to something that's hard enough. 
to, to programs that have enough moving parts that get the job done, um, you're, you're simply adding more rules, adding more potential snags that are completely actually unnecessary to the program. So a lot of the chrononutrition models are done on sedentary subjects, on crap diets provided by the research lab. So if you were to simply just clean the diet up, you know, overhaul the diet, get the macronutrients right and get the food selection right for the goal and for health and for all of the positive stuff. Um, shifting the shifting around the temporal shifting around of the intake through the day has trivial impact and creating rules around the placement and the distribution of, of the meals outside of you know, athletic goals and, and athletic performance goals, which require that. You're looking at a soccer mom or a soccer dad who wants to just get healthier and lose 20 to 40 pounds of body fat. You know, the difference between telling, telling him, okay, you got to eat all your foods within this window and it's got to be got to be from 8 a.m. To, to, you know, to 5 p.m. and don't, don't eat anything after that because look at this study. <laughs> it starts getting ridiculous, bro. Mm -hmm. And that's where you kind of find out who's, who's working with real people and who's just kind of digging their nose in, 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 the, in the research. And a lot of, of that stuff is, is kind of silly because it's not even optimal. If you were to take the um, early time time restricted feeding model where um, there's better insulin sensitivity and glucose control with it, with concentrating the bulk of your calories in the earlier part of the day. Okay. That's cool. But if you put somebody on a sound exercise program and they're getting leaner, none of that matters. Not only that, but if you neglect a, let's say a final protein feeding, because you're, you're keeping off of your, you stopped eating by like, you know, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., you stopped eating. Well, you've just lost an opportunity to dose protein pre-bed for somebody who's trying to maximize their rate of uh, muscle gain or their muscle retention in hypocaloric conditions or even eucaloric conditions where they're just trying to gain muscle. You've um, cost yourself a, a, an opportunity for um, initiating a, uh, a microanabolic event. So the accumulation of, of these sort of things over time can either um, augment the gains of muscle or, or help preserve muscle tissue over time. And, you know, I could go into another tangent about um, as we get older, the challenges of, of maintaining muscle tissue. You want to be able to exhaust all the hypotheticals that allow you to maintain lean body mass and that allow you to uh, maximize the functional capacity of muscle. And that's not gonna happen by neglecting nighttime protein intake. <laughs> so there's, we can talk basic stuff or we can talk optimality, but a lot of the um, early time, time restricted feeding models are, are just not optimal from a, a, a muscle centric standpoint. And the way that I approach maximizing health and longevity, it kind of begins with um, maximizing the functional capacity of the musculoskeletal system, because that'll drive your ability to um, start the engine on the cardiovascular system. And then everything just kind of bleeds out from there. Um, <laughs> dude, if, if you can stay active, lean and muscular, and you maximize the uh those adaptations and you program around those objectives and of course you are educated on proper food selection within and across food groups that's really the way to drive longevity um yeah and there's there's other other stuff related to that man that that's coming to mind but i'm gonna shut up now and let you ask the next question yeah, so i guess one question to follow up with that is do you think this is coming from a misinterpretation of research because even like like the not eating one hour post waking up 
Um, I've heard that as well. Uh, and, and there's, there's times where people talk about those things and they, and, and insulin sensitivity is another really good one that we've dug into on, on the podcast with our CSO, Brandon Roberts. Um, but it, it's almost as if people are taking research and using big terms and complex stuff to sell these ideas to kind of fluff it up and make it sound really sexy. And the reality is, is most people who are trustworthy coaches are really, really indoctrinated into the research. People like yourself who have been doing this for decades, um, their information is almost more boring and less sexy and less clickbaity. So it's like, if this person is selling information that is not nearly as sexy or exciting as the other person, it's probably actually a safe bet to trust that person more, right? Um, but but back to my question is, do you think it's a misinterpretation of the research? Because there's sometimes we hear people talk and you're like, man, I mean, that sounds fucking legit. He, I mean, he sounds smart, <laughs> but no. It's, it's not necessarily a misinterpretation of the research, but it, it's more of like a misapplication of it. Mm. Uh, because the research basis is there, but it's hypothetical. <laughs> it's hypothetical. And what people fail to do a lot of the times is pan back and see which program variables have the highest impact. So for example, a, a just running an energy deficit in and of itself for an individual whose goal it is to get in better shape, lose body fat, lose body weight. Um, as long as that's happening <laughs> and as long as that's programmed in, then the little details, you, you want to make it as simple as possible and you want to minimize the amount of rules that you impose on the individual because it, every rule that you add, it adds a, a, an increase in the potential for non-compliance and frustration. So the more simple you can make a program, the easier it will be for somebody to follow. Now, with that said, if you tell somebody that, all right, so we're going to confine your eating window to five hours in the early part of the day, but you can, you don't have to restrict during that five hours that can work for some people. And that's pretty simple, right? <laughs> so now the, the caveat with something like that is well, how long is that person going to sustain that? You know, they may they may love it for the first month, the first two months. Like, wow, I, I really can eat whatever I want within this five hour window. This is really great. Wow. And then after two months, oh, they get a girlfriend. Girlfriend likes to eat at at eight p.m., nine p.m. Ah, oh, they can't hang on because they want to eat with a girlfriend. Oh crap! They're, what happened to my five hour window program? Oh no! What do I do now? That five hour window was working somehow. I don't know how, but it was working. What am I going to do now? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't get on diets to be on the diet for four weeks at a time and succeed at the end of four weeks. We want to look more like, okay, four years, maybe who knows, four decades. What can you sustain for that? What, what is realistic and doable for a lifetime? And of course there are exceptions like athletes and, um, especially in the physique realm where we, they have these stints of time where they do crazy stuff. But for the general population, man, um, the whole idea of time windows being particularly special is really looking at the, <clears throat> looking at the grains of sand and, and missing the, the boulders. Got it. So to carry on to this, uh, kind of fat approach, not, not time restricted base, but, uh, you posted something on carnivore a while back that I saw. Um, and I'm going to bring up carnivore cause I, I'm kind of trying to touch for the listeners. If, if you haven't noticed, I'm trying to touch on all the things that try to defy calories in versus calories out. So you can kind of debunk and, and we can work through them. But, um, carnivore is one of those ones. And I actually, it, it's funny. The thing you posted, I believe I saw that I'm thinking of had something to do with, uh, gum and teeth health for some reason, I think because of lack of vitamin C, I believe it was. But, mm -hmm. um, I had a guy, a troll, I would call him, comment on something that I was talking about, calories in versus calories out. And uh, he said it, that doesn't apply. It's all about hormones and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, I was like, oh, what kind of diet do you follow? Carnivore. I was like, oh, okay, do you track your macros? No, I don't need to because I'm following carnivore. I was like, oh, have you ever considered, because his claim was that he kept his calories the same, but he lost a lot of weight. He's like, I eat the same amount of calories, but I lose a little bunch of weight. I was like, oh, do you record your macros? No, I don't need to. It's just about calories. And I was like, oh, okay, well, have you ever considered that now you're just eating twice as much protein and significantly less carbs. So your calories might be the same, but your protein is exponentially higher. And if we look at research, especially from like 
Jose Antonio's lab, we know that that might actually have a different effect, especially if you drop carbs and fat to just eat a ton of fucking protein all day. And then uh, he stopped commenting back. But so I'm assuming that he didn't have the answer to that. But my question for you is uh, with carnivore, is it, uh, I mean, obviously it doesn't defy calories in versus calories out. Um, is there, are there dangers to this? I mean, people are telling people not to eat vegetables. It just sounds crazy to me. Like don't eat any vegetables. That just sounds very odd. Uh, but are there dangers to this? What is your opinion on why people are even jumping into this in the first place? Whew. You know, carnivore, anybody who's, let's say they've been struggling with, with dieting and they've been eating the standard Western diet, which is way too many total calories and um, just a, a, a cornucopia of, of highly processed, uh, highly refined foods, especially re refined carbohydrate and fat combinations. Um, and then they, they have an extra, let's, let's say extra 20 pounds of body fat on them that they don't need. But any, anyone, anybody in that state, you put them on the carnivore diet, they're going to lose a butt ton of weight, butt ton of body fat. And they're obviously going to feel a, a whole hell of a lot better from finally not overeating total calories. And as you mentioned, if you increase your protein, you just just put it through the roof that's going to default your intake of the other macros to just much less because of the satiating effect of protein and when you remove <clears throat> the <laughs> most of your dietary options you're basically going to be cornered into consuming a lot less calories and the calories you do consume are going to be a lot less palatable and you're not going to be motivated to overeat it. And you're not going to have the tendency to passively overconsume calories the way that you would if you were just kind of sitting in front of the TV and, and downing like a bag of chips. So the beauty in the carnivore diet is the default towards less calories, man, less mm -hmm. calories in. And you're finally getting enough protein, and, and you're probably going to be retaining muscle mass while you while you're while you're carnivoring, <laughs> um, and and it really has a a positive impact on on people's mental state when they see these spectacular results that are basically the equivalent of doing Atkins for the first time, mm. except you're not eating any of those pesky vegetables. <laughs> 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 um, Okay, so with that said, and, and let, let me tell you, man, um, a lot of people when they do carnivore, and if you if you you don't incur micronutrient deficiencies, you can sustain carnivore for a long time, years, <laughs> and be apparently fine. Um, so and and a lot a lot of people are doing that a lot of people are, are rolling the dice with that but but and then of course the, the big but is is it optimal and the answer as far as we can tell from what we know about nutritional science today is no it's not optimal it's the lesser of the two it's one of the evils <laughs> i mean standard western diet is going to kill you okay carnivore is going to kill you a lot more slowly <laughs> and you'll maybe you'll look better dying on, on the carnivore diet you know um but you might be happier i don't know you, some people are uh vegetables aren't aren't the the you know the most exciting thing ever uh and if you cut vegetables out that well your your quality of life might go up for a, for for a little bit however when we look at the science on chronic disease, we look at the science on the development of uh, atherosclerosis, uh, the development of heart disease, um, the development of cancer even. Look at the totality of the evidence. You don't wanna cherry pick uh, the stuff that just, just clicks with your preexistent narrow belief system. Then you would be in some pretty heavy denial very heavy denial to conclude that vegetables do not have, vegetables and fruits 
and other plant foods as well do not have protective effects and health promoting effects from a chronic disease standpoint. The evidence is just too consistent, too solid, too deep and too broad to deny that. So I think that carnivore is great in the sense that you cut out a lot of junk foods and you finally get enough freaking protein um, and you are not eating and overeating total calories, but you're missing out on the optimality that uh, vegetables, fruits, um, legumes, tubers, uh, and the array of plant foods offer to the diet, even, even, even grains. <laughs> um, grains are a lot more expendable than the other food groups. And, and frankly, they're, they're a lot more problematic depending on the degree of refinement and, and how they're packaged up. But even grains can offer some health benefit to, to long-term health. And so I think that when you think in terms of optimality, that's where uh, the carnivore diet fails. I think a big thing there too is people, people will make like revert to historical things that try to justify it. And it's never made sense to me. Even like with paleo, they did that a lot is in to me. I've always been, you know, just because they didn't have microwaves doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. We're smarter than that now. But, um, you know, with this diet, I've even seen the claims made online of, uh, as funny as it sounds, talking about Eskimos and people in like Arctic areas where they didn't have produce and they do just fine and they're healthy. And even then I would assume most of those people eat everything. They eat the marrow, they eat the tongue, they eat the liver, they eat the, all that. And so as we know, a lot of organ meats are very, very high in micronutrients. So even they're less susceptible, but the average person doing carnivore is just eating ribeyes and bacon every day. They're not eating liver and heart of a, of a goat or a cow or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's always, it just, it's always funny to me that people revert back to that, um, kind of way of thinking. And, and that kind of applies to the next, the next topic or question I wanted to ask you in this realm is, is basically just, um, high carb versus low carb. And I think a lot of people gravitate towards a, the low carb, high fat approach and the keto approach because of ancestral things and, um, so on and so forth. And, uh, intermittent fasting is very similar as well as, you know, they couldn't, they had to go forage and hunt. So they didn't eat all day and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we're talking about optimality and we're talking about today and, and with today and with bodybuilders, body composition clients and gen pop people who just want to lose weight, build muscle or maintain muscle. Do you have a preference between the two? Do you, do you believe there's more than just calories here? Uh, I feel like there's been a, a search towards carbs and fat levels don't matter at all because it's just calories. Um, but when you get a little bit more advanced and you talk to people who are talking about like the 5% of people who want to get really lean or, or shredded, then all of a sudden we see a favor towards lower fat, higher carb. Um, do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think there's value in that? Is there any science to back that up? Yeah. These are such good questions, man. Like every question you're asking, we could spend a whole podcast mm -hmm. episode on. Um, okay. So I'm going to get to that. Let, let me just mention about the carnivore diet that there was a recent uh, in quote study that was published and uh, it, it was by um, Lenners and colleagues, L-E-N-N-E-R-Z and colleagues. And the, the title of the study is Behavioral Characteristics and Self-Reported Health Status Among 2029 Adults Consuming a Carnivore Diet. Mm. Yeah, and, and so um, they're on it long-term and they reported mostly positive um, results. And so they were happier and, and all kinds of measures of health were improved from pre uh, compared to their pre carnivore uh, dieting status. Okay. So this was sort of a, um, a convenience sample. It was a survey based um, publication. So you're essentially looking at a community of, of uh, people on the carnivore diet who were, were basically self-selected. And so there's going to be a, certain degree of uh, selection bias there going in, but um, they're, they're doing fine, except for a couple things, one of them more concerning than the other. So uh, one parameter that is slightly concerning is the increase of LDL cholesterol, but the more concerning parameter is um, they, there was a, uh, a subsample of 15, 15 people who tracked their coronary artery cap, coronary artery calcium score. 
And um, that parameter went up significantly um, compared to having started the carnivore diet or compared to pre-carnivore diet levels. So that is cause for concern, especially if that keeps trending up. Um, and that is, uh, that, that should leave a, a big enough question mark for, for people to con at least consider doing a modified carnivore <laughs> type of diet where you do add plants in there. And if you want to stay, you know, mostly ketogenic, you would add uh, vegetables and, and, and fruits that have a low uh, available carb content. So, so yeah, there's, uh, there's different levels to this stuff. And I think that's probably the first study examining carnivore dieters, correct? Yeah, okay. it is. It is the first one. Okay. And it's not a controlled intervention. It is an observational study. It's almost like this just descriptive exploratory type of study. And that, hey, kudos for, for the folks who put that together and put it out there because it's a start. Mm -hmm. It's a start for us to look into this. And uh, but yeah, that the increase in coronary artery calcium score was uh, kind of like, oh, boy. Yeah, I want to get some might want to get some uh, some fiber back in there. I want to get some, uh, you know, some veggies and fruits back in there at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's good because there's, uh, like I said, there's, it's the first one. So if we're already seeing negative things, I mean, we can expect to potentially see more. And, and it's good for people because people just watch what they see uh, the latest Joe Rogan guests do. And, and I love Joe Rogan's podcast, trust me. But uh, when it comes to nutrition advice, I always <laughs> keep a filter on. I think people need to do that for that and Netflix documentaries or anything like that. But unfortunately, that's that's people's a lot of people's first first stop for nutritional information. <laughs> you know, to Joe's credit, he, he has had Lane on there mm -hmm. a couple few times. Who else has he had on there? Dom Who's legit. Dom Diagostino was a good one. Dom is a good one, but he's he's so biased towards yeah, people because that's what he yeah. you know that's that's the kind of work he does. Well, when him and Lane were on there together, it was it was a good balance. Okay. They, he at least couldn't because they did a debate on there, which was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had Andy Galpin mm -hmm. on there. Yep, which is great. Um, I I think that's kind of the extent uh, to which he's had legit guys on there is Lane and Andy mm -hmm. in terms of the nutrition realm. Um, and I think that's it, man. Uh, he's had a bunch of other folks on there multiple times who just kind of reinforce some mythical stuff, but, mm -hmm. but you know what, man, um, Rogan, Rogan's folks have contacted me twice to be on the show. And this was back in 2014 and 2015 before they were the monster that they are now where, um, yeah, yeah, I wasn't available when I was asked to be on the show both times. Both times I was not available. So um, hopefully in the not too distant future, maybe we'll be able to uh, pull some maneuvers and see if we can get get the science back on there, you know? Yeah, it's needed, man. <laughs> it's definitely needed. Um, okay, so, so yeah, your, your question, your question was yeah. basically if I could run it back, what is the deal with high carb versus low carb and um in, in you know for for the various goals that it is it true that as long as you get your protein straight then carb and fat proportions don't matter mm -hmm. right yep the short answer is that's true <laughs> that's the, that's the facts and that even applies to non um, non endurance focused athletic pursuits. It even applies to that because it, the the reason we know that is because there's a ton of low carb and keto research that has been tested in athletic performance contexts. And you know what, man, highly trained athletes they can pretty much do well on kind of whatever you throw at them in terms of a uh, carb and fat proportion, as long as protein is right. Uh, now, if you want to win Olympic gold, or you want to become a world champion in a sport that 
uh, requires athletic performance with um, endurance demands mixed in, probably not going to make it ketoing. You're probably not going to make it. Uh, now, there are some outliers in the ultra endurance realm who have done very well on low carbohydrate. But when you dig in a little further and see their protocols, they're slamming carbs down throughout the whole thing. And yeah. they're, um, they're not necessarily ketoing their way through the ultras. Um, so there's some misconceptions going on in there and, and a lack of provision of the full picture of these folks protocols. But if you look at the general population who is just trying to get in better shape, you know, middle-aged folks trying to recapture the, the, the health and the youthful exuberance of their college days, let's say, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And, and the beauty of high carb versus low carb not mattering is it opens the door to individualize the programs as long as you can properly teach the folks how to, how to achieve these targets, you know? Um, like if somebody enjoys protein and mostly protein and fat, then they can reach their body composition goals on it. If somebody enjoys low fat, high carb, they can succeed just as effectively. And everybody is going to be different in that regard. So, so you just have to find out what the individual's personal preference is and then just take it from there because there have been literally dozens of studies showing that there's no significant differences in body composition change uh, from when you compare low fat versus um, uh, low carb, high fat type of models. Now, the, the only wrinkle that I throw in here regarding the the lack of it mattering between low carb and, and low fat is the goal of maximizing muscle mass. Okay. So when you want to maximize muscle, muscle mass, especially in dieting conditions, <clears throat> you're going to preserve less lean body mass on a ketogenic model versus a high carb, low fat model. Now, the amount of difference that we're talking about might not matter unless it is a highly competitive situation like like a physique competition where you're putting everybody's physiques under a microscope and the fuller guy is gonna get a better placing than the flat and stringy dude okay but if we're talking about people just walking around in the real world and a non-competitive situation then the lean body mass retention advantage of the person in the high carb low fat diet, it's not going to be a, a factor. So, so yeah, that's the answer to that. That's perfect. No, I think, uh, the only thing I've seen that made me really favor, uh, high carb, low fat in certain individuals outside of just anecdotal bodybuilders, cause that's just what they do. And again, this is somebody stepping on stage. So obviously that's the, the extreme rel. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe it was an observational case study and it was like Helms, uh, maybe Peter Fishin. I want to say Brandon Roberts was actually on it as well. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of just like basically a case study tracking bodybuilders throughout their prep and looking at those who did low carb versus those who did high carb. The majority did high carb and the people who placed best did high carb. And it kind of just lends itself to what you're saying there. If you get absolutely peeled and shredded, you might look better from doing the high carb approach because it's going to fuel muscle retention better and keep your glycogen levels higher, which makes you look fuller. And I think that's, yeah. that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the paper you're talking about, I, I believe um, is the paper you're talking about is uh, if, if you're talking about the paper where they looked at the nutritional intakes of people who placed in the top five versus placed out of the top five, mm -hmm. um, what they saw was they saw basically carb intakes that would be body weight times two, it, body weight in pounds times two. In, in terms of carb grams for prep um, and even a little bit more than that. So four to five grams per kilogram of body weight was the carb intake of, of, of natty, of drug-free competitors who placed in the top five at elite levels. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is a paper by uh, my friend, Andrew Chappelle, not Dave Chappelle, Andrew <laughs> Chappelle. <laughs> 
uh, Dave is cancel proof, you know, uh, Andrew is not cancel. Proof. <laughs> so um, it's really interesting to see that uh, a lot of people are, are so afraid of cars, but here you have the most peeled natty competitors mm -hmm. taken down two grams plus per pound of body weight in carbs leading up until the contest. And of course their, their, their fat intake is low. Um, but it's just pretty dang interesting how the cream rises to the top success leaves clues. And so it becomes important to observe what the, what the winners are doing, you know, because they might not be getting everything right. They might be doing stuff. Uh, they might be succeeding in, in, in spite of some of the things they're doing, but chances are they're doing most of the things right. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since there is a consistency of wins that happen with X set of, uh, habits and protocols here. So, um, so yeah, I, I, for natties and even for non natties, just under carbing is not going to benefit muscle mass in a competitive physique type of scenario. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, a good thing, the last thing I'll say on this is a good thing to remember is that when we look at studies comparing a lot of these things, they're usually not on competitive bodybuilders. That's why this was like an observational kind of thing that I was referring to. Um, just because, I mean, if you want to do an eight week diet study and you ask a bodybuilder who is extremely passionate and routine and regimen about what he's doing, he's probably going to say, no, you're not changing what I'm doing. I'm doing, <laughs> I don't care about your study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. So, uh, <laughs> we have to consider that, but, um, we're running up on an hour. I want to respect your time and I could keep going on and on. And any of these topics, like you said, we could just keep going down a rabbit hole. So I appreciate the time. I want to give you a chance to kind of let us know where to find your content and also where to find your research review and stuff like that. Cause I think people can learn so much from you. You've been doing this so long, man, that you have a wealth of knowledge and you've always, um, kept it real for lack of better terms and not gone into these dogmatic approaches, which is appreciated. So tell everybody where they can find your stuff. Oh, uh, thank you, Cody. Uh you can find my research review at alanaragon.com. And I also wrote a protein book a few months back. And you can find that on, on alanaragon.com. And uh, in the middle of next year, that's when, well, that's when the publishers tell me, my new book is going to be available. So I finished the first draft of it a couple weeks ago. And it took up the last year of my life putting this book together. And it's the first solo um, nutrition book I've written since 2007. And uh, I wanted to put together the evidence-based nutrition book. Um, and so that's, that's what I've done. And uh, it incorporates a lot of my field experience as well as the research collaborations I've done with, with other good, good bros. Um, and I'm really excited about that, but I'm trying not to get too excited because it's six months out. So like June ish of, of 2022, my book will be available. But in the meantime, um, my research review is my baby. It's my main project. Uh, and that is at alanaragon.com. And I, I really appreciate you having me on Cody. And I really appreciate you having figured your life out at 18 and having stuck with this for the last 10 plus years. And it's just really awesome to hear that, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. That means a lot. And it's, it's an honor for me to have you on the podcast, dude, because you've been somebody that's like been a mentor from afar for a long time. So this has been really cool. And uh, I'll link all that in the show notes for everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll have you back on before your book. If not, we'll let everybody know when it launches. But um, I'll put Alan's, Aragon, uh, Alan's Instagram in the description as well. So you guys can follow him there because I'm sure when the book's getting close, he'll announce it there as well. Um, but yeah, I'll put all that in the show notes, man. And again, thank you for your time today. This has been awesome. Thank you.